All right, everyone, welcome back to my fresh run in Tom Clancy's The Division. This is episode three, so, you know, in this episode, I'm going to be looking at the Madison Field Hospital. And this is what gives you access to your, you know, your contamination masks, your your medical skills or your healing skills, and even, I guess, uh, your pulse ability, actually. So this is probably one of the more important wings for many of the DPS players, just because, you know, self-healing and the ability to pulse and get extra, you know, crit chance, crit damage. That stuff, you know, can greatly help you out. Now, one of the things that I kind of liked about this mission was the somewhat appearance of the JTF actually, you know, being backup for you, which they did, you know, starting out the mission, they actually do enter in with you and they do actually engage the enemy. Now, you know, of course, we all know their effectiveness, but just the fact that, you know, they are there, like actually showing that, hey, the JTF does something is kind of a nice touch. You know, a lot of the times, you're doing all this stuff completely by yourself, you're investigating everything, you're fighting everything, and the JTF is largely nowhere to be seen, even though they're supposedly helping, you know, protect and defend this city. So it's it is kind of one of those situations where, like, I wish that they included this more often, you know, just because obviously a lot of the JTF are military, a lot of them are police officers, so I figured that they would have a more active role in the game. And now I'm not saying that every mission should have them doing everything for you and you know just being bullet sponges for you distracting the enemy for you but in some ways you know it's just kind of nice to have like a realistic setting you know where you're going in with these other trained people to deal with situations of course you know it doesn't happen throughout the whole mission which is kind of a little disappointing the fact that they're just sitting there waiting for you to finish up you know that's uh, that, was, that was a little annoying this is kind of one of those things that i like you know in division two you had the first mission with the uh the hotel where Kelso was waiting for you on the roof, you know, and she was actually engaging the enemies with her skills and stuff like that. You know, that was kind of a nice touch. I, I actually liked that aspect. So I do like when there's this, you know, somewhat realistic, you know, you're not the only person, you know, you're not just being dispatched over and over again by people who aren't helping you at all. And that's why I do like this touch. Um, I, I wish more missions would actually do this. I, I do wish that there was, um, more participation by you know uh, other friendlies the division one actually did this a, a couple times you know where you signal the jtf and you know they'd come in did you know swarm from the backside or something like that and you know just be a distraction um there were a couple of missions like that and division two you, you mostly just saw kelso helping out you really didn't get any other uh, uh, like you know civilians or anything like that doing anything but those missions, I generally just kind of like the feeling that they provided to the mission. Now, another thing you're probably going to notice is that, you know, my shooting sucks. Um, <laughs> you know, this is this is one of the huge differences between the Division and Division 2. Um, Division 1, I would say, had much more realistic uh, weapon recoil than the Division 2 did. Now, you may like it, you may not like it. I mean, it just really just depends on your personal preference. But the one thing I'll say is, you know, it's, it's really hard to make a stat like weapon stability or weapon accuracy matter in a game if the weapons themselves don't really, you know, put that as a necessity. So in Division 1, I think it was a lot more beneficial to actually run stability over some other options. You know, you know I think you could you roll it on your backpack and stuff like that. And it was a viable option to do that. So, you know, that's one of the things that I liked. Um, you know, so you may see my aiming, you know, just general accuracy and stuff like that rather pretty much suffered now up here is one of the things that actually kind of disappointed me about the game so we have this lock pick door and we have a contamination zone now when i first went through this uh i i died i, I opened up that door went through the contamination zone and died i had no idea what it was um of course as you go through the game you'll find out that you need to use your medical wing to basically unlock these contamination masks and you get up to, I think, like level four contamination mask. And that enables you to actually go through these areas. And of course, you know, the lockpick mechanic itself. Um, so I, I enjoyed the fact that, you know, you needed to collect these lockpicks to open these doors. I enjoyed the fact that you need to do unlock a specific uh, tree or I guess a specific um, perk from your medical wing to be able to actually survive through these zones. And when you go into this game, you know, fresh, at least when I did, like I was, I was kind of impressed, like, oh man, this is going to build up. This is, you know, kind of cool. It's going to provide me, you know, a reason to invest in these things. And the unfortunateness of the situation is that the mechanic pretty much just dies. 
I mean, there are specific reasons why the contamination zones are there and, you know, things you can do. But as a whole, it really feels like it was a very underdeveloped mechanic. Um, I enjoyed it a lot, especially in the Dark Zone, where, you know, if you were low level in the Dark Zone, um, because obviously the Dark Zone was split up between different brackets of, of player level. So if you were, you know, level 1 to 14, you would go into the first bracket. If you were level um, 15 to 19, you'd go into the second bracket. But the one fun thing was, if you were level 14, you know, there were areas where if you chose to invest in this mask, you could go. And if, let's say, you know, you were being attacked by rogues and you had these contamination masks, you could end up escaping the rogues by running through the contamination and they couldn't come and get you. So you had a chance to actually survive and get away. And if you wanted to actively, you know, be the strongest player in the server, if you wanted to be, um, I guess, the person who was having the most... Uh, damage bonuses or the most you know healing bonuses and that stuff you probably wouldn't go with a contamination mask so this provided a, you know a, a different balance to the gameplay where you know I, i'm not going for the best i'm just going for getting away or i'm just you know trying to escape the enemies and that, that kind of stuff so th there was some uniqueness there that i really enjoyed from the low levels but in that area specifically you know like I said, I died when I went in there and I had no idea. So it was kind of a, an impressive idea that, oh, I'm going to have to come back here. There's going to be reasons why I want to go through this stuff again. There's going to be a lot of um, unique things that I'm just not going to be ready for as I, you know, encounter them. And unfortunately, you know, what you pretty much discover shortly after you start playing this is that a lot of this stuff just never got flushed out in the game. You know, so you'll find lots of mechanics that just, they were there. You know, they had an idea behind them. They probably had some intention. But in the end, they just didn't go anywhere. And that was probably one of my biggest disappointments with the game. And the Madison Field Hospital was, you know, impressive to me at the time because it looked like there was going to be this depth to the gameplay. And that was kind of something that I really was looking forward to. You know, I was really looking forward to how this game was going to feel, you know, running back through all these things that I couldn't do you know, when I initially started playing through it. And unfortunately, like I, you know, said, it just didn't quite work out. But anyway, you know, if the Division 3 does happen, that is kind of one of the things that I really hope for. I really hope that there are some intricacies with the design of the game. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily want everything to be locked behind stuff. I don't want it to be like so restrictive that you can't do anything ever. But I do hope that the future of this game does include a little bit more of a selective progression system. You know, I, I do kind of like where they went with the whole specializations, but at the same time, the ability to just flip-flop on a dime without, you know, any real effort. Um, the fact that many of them didn't really offer a full uniqueness to them. I mean, some of them, you know, like you got fire resistance or you got uh, a skill tier or you got some extra headshot damage. Like some of them were okay, but most of it was just kind of generic and boring. And a lot of that was just because, you know, players demanded that certain things should be the way that they are now. You know, like before the specializations were designed for a specific set of weapons. So I think like this, the, uh, the demolitionist was originally like SMGs and shotguns or something like that. That was like the bonuses you could get and the pistol. So you couldn't get the other bonuses and that kind of made people mad. So you couldn't use these special things to get these bonuses, which kind of limited the power in, in select areas. Of course, once they nerfed that, then everyone forgot about it and you just pick pretty much the <laughs> the tactician for everything or now you're picking the firewall for everything, you know, just getting that, that shield buff or you're getting that skill tier. I mean, you know, it just kind of creates a genericness to it. But I, again, I do hope that they do add some sort of selectiveness to Division 3 because I just think that it it enhances the way that the game feels. You know, if you can go into the dark zone at level 30 and have everything unlocked and this, you know, no real worry, there's no there's no uniqueness that some other player has to kind of outplay you, then that kind of feels a little bit stale to me. So as I said in the 14 dark zone, you know, having that contamination mask did give you a benefit. Of course, it came with a downside that you probably didn't have the skills that the other person had or you probably didn't have your signature skill. You know, those were very important early on. At least the medical wing one was pretty important, just being able to avoid that, you know, death blow. You know, there were just a bunch of different things, you know, like, you know, talents and perks and stuff like that that could help you in the dark zone. And if you went with the masks, the contamination mask, obviously you had a different 
benefit than the other players. So, you know, it, it was really just kind of a trade-off, which one do you pick? And that's just kind of what made the game fun to me. I mean, no matter what you're playing, whether it was the story, whether it was the Dark Zone, you had a uniqueness. So, like, if you were in a group, you know, you could go into a specific direction while your teammates probably went into another direction. So that, that, that was mostly for, you know, co-op players. So if you had a dedicated team who were, who were always playing all the missions with, you know, these characters going through the story together, you had the ability to be more unique than your teammates. Now, there was some of that in Division 2, but I don't know, largely just, you know, the whole shade thing, just I, I didn't really appreciate that very much. <clears throat> so if there is a Division 3, this is kind of something that I would hope is included, you know, the uh, ability to be a little bit more unique. If you look at other RPGs, the respec mechanic in the game is generally fairly common. And the division, I mean, I'm not saying that everything should be locked behind specific things, but I am saying that without this ability to, I guess, restrict the player's choices, you definitely end up with, you know, super metas. And that's kind of what I think the biggest problem with the division two is there is no real restriction on metas. Um, you know, the firewall specialization is great, but it only adds like a, a tiny bit. And it's not really that hard to just change the firewall specialization. And I think one of the best ways for the division to avoid this kind of meta mechanic where pretty much most players just play one or two different builds would be for them to actually have these active restrictions on them. So if you wanted to invest in, to a you know a very good SMG build, you would pick this specialization. But if you wanted to be a more tanky SMG build, you'd probably pick this. You know, like th there'd be a, a wide range of different things that would be more beneficial for a specific playstyle. And I think that's kind of what's missing. You know, just this ability to choose what you want and be different than other players. Uh, you know, if it's all focused completely on the stat system. Well, then the, all of the stats need to be really amazing. And, you know, the, the sad nature of it is you, know, you you either have a stat that's good or you have a stat that's crap. And if you try to make a, you know, a rather terrible stat really strong, like, um, you know, let's say like hazard protection. If you try to make hazard protection or explosive resistance really strong so that people actually want to use it, well, then you make it basically completely OP. Um, so everyone ends up running hazard protection and explosive resistance and skills are completely useless. So there's, you know, a lot of uh, finagling that you need to do to actually m ensure that some of these stats are viable, that some of these stats are usable and not just gimmicky, not, you know, kind of cheesy, not ruining pretty much everyone else's build. You know, you have to be very careful with it. And I think if they make it a more restrictive system, and I'm, again, I'm not saying that it has to be locked in so once you hit 30 this is all you ever get no there, there should be some sort of way whether you have to you know kind of like uh, pay credits or you know uh, in, invest in these specific resources to reset something you know whatever it is but there should be some sort of mechanic that allows and encourages this diversity without people just constantly flip-flopping over and over again to basically just overcome whatever tiny little obstacle that they encounter but overall, I think there should be some way that limits a little bit the mechanics of, of what a player can select. Because if you can just go through and pick the best out of everything, and that's all you need to worry about, just mathematically picking what is best without you know any real appreciation for the negatives that come with it, then this is this is where it gets boring at. You know, if if a a specific build, like let's say a max crit chance, crit damage SMG build, can't invest fully into a specific area, so you, you don't get access to this nice defensive thing, or you don't get access to this skill or something like that, then you might not always want to be that. You know, that might not be the meta. There might not be a meta. There might be some that are really good for a specific purpose, but in other areas, they kind of suffer. So you have to kind of have a balancer. And that's what I would really wish for the division, um, especially in PvP, because, you know, one of the biggest issues in PvP is that once somebody finds something that's just the perfect combination of everything and you don't have to worry about anything else. You know, this was, in, in, when Division 2 launched, this was the, the clutch meta, you know, running the clutch uh, vector build, then you didn't have to do anything. You know, you just beamed a player pretty much in that entire magazine they, they either dropped or if they didn't, you still were able to outheal them completely. 
And then, of course, it kind of became the Adrenaline Rush Intimidate combo, where everyone was running that with Lady Death. You know, when you have these mechanics where it just becomes overly cheesy and people can just kind of get the damage, get the healing, get all this stuff in one build and not have to worry about really anything besides just hitting a target from, you know, like four feet away. You get a lot of this build disparity and, you know, the lack of, I guess, effectiveness of certain builds. And, and that's kind of what ruins it. You know, you don't want a skill build to just become, you know, like a master of everything. But anyway, in the next video, I'm going to be going into the subway more to rescue Paul Rhodes. Thank you guys for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.